Um, so today we're going to be talking about the MVP or the minimum viable product. Um, it's a term that's basically coined to talk about the minimal set of features that are required in order for you to actually learn. So one of the things that I want to drill into your mind is that the MVP is not actually a product. I like to call it the minimum viable experiment. So uh, what I'll try to do is I'm going to uh, talk about my experience making a minimum viable product, how we actually got to the minimum viable product, and what happened after we shipped the product and how we got there. Um, the idea is that you guys can also ask me questions and I can impart some knowledge that I do have. Um, it's a little hard to make uh, enterprise software, uh, especially for construction companies, as you learned. Um, but it's also a great industry to be in for product managers because there just aren't a lot of uh, product managers in construction. So um, the agenda today is going to be, uh, we'll do intro introductions, we'll talk a little bit about construction and real estate, and we'll talk about product discovery um, using a product that I actually built that's in market today. Uh, prototypes and uh, testing, we'll just have a conversation about it, and also how to define the MVP and then some uh, questions and answers. So, uh, my name is uh, Niasha. Uh, I'm a senior product manager lead um, for construction financials. Uh, the way that we are structured at our company is uh, technically this is a group product manager position for other uh, tech companies. So I have other product managers that work under me and a team of five uh, product squads. Uh, and I only focus on something that we call construction financials, which is how do you know what the cost of a building is in real time as construction happens. Um, previously, I worked as a senior product manager at a company called Procore, uh, and I focused on invoicing, compliance, and also payments. Um, today we're going to be focusing on a product that I worked at, Procore. So it was one of the first uh, in the industry, uh, the only one that can do what we're about to talk about, but uh, the story is pretty fascinating as well. Alright, so as you know, construction is a very massive uh, industry. Uh, it's one of the leading indicators for an economy. If something bad's about to happen, housing always slows down first. Uh, usually about a year before like the economy tanks. Um, it's large, uh, about 13 to 15 percent of the global GDP, very low productivity. Um, it's only increased by roughly about one percent uh, per year over the last uh, 20 years. If you actually increase productivity in construction by one percent, it's well over trillions of dollars that are added back uh, into the economy. Um, additionally, it's the second least digitized uh, industry after agriculture. Um, to be more specific, when they mean agriculture, they mean hunting. So there isn't an app to like go and hunt a deer or something like that yet. Um, so as I spoke about, the market size is about 15% of the global GDP. So it's one of the largest uh, industries. Not a lot of technology happening. Um, and the reason why technology and construction is important is because of these two statistics. 20% of all construction projects um, are always over schedule. And the reason why the schedule is important is because there's usually somebody that owns the building uh, or the space that you're trying to build and they borrow large amounts of money from the bank. Time equals interest. Right? So if the construction company is late with the project, the owner starts paying interest to the bank on a space that they can't monetize yet. Do any of you own homes that you've renovated and or have built? All right, you renovated or? Yeah, yeah. how is that process? Uh, in line with the KPIs. <laughs> it was over budget and uh, it was over schedule, so it was like 20% was over schedule. Yeah. How yeah, but how is it to build like a year to get the possession? Yeah, no and were you paying some money to the bank yeah. or the right? And you couldn't use that space, right? Yeah. So uh, that is essentially like the bigger problems that uh, we are trying to solve. 
And to give you some context into who are the players um, on any construction project, there's usually an owner, like himself and herself. They hire a contractor, or in the US, the owner and the general contractor can be one person. Um, and then they also hire what we call subcontractors, or subs, as they're uh, called. Typically, um, construction is mostly like a relationship-based uh, value chain, meaning that there's usually one operator on a uh, project or an owner. Uh, there's typically one architect. Um, there's an engineer that draws up like the plumbing, all the electrical lines that are coming into your building. Uh, they can be between two. The largest projects that I've seen have about 10 of them. Um, there's usually one general contractor who then hires his friends. Uh, they all take the money and run to Vegas. Uh, <laughs> that's a joke. But there's actually a true story about uh, a subcontractor who got paid, ran away to Vegas, and never did a job. Uh, then there are the suppliers. Um, so usually about you know, 10 to 100 of them. So these are the paint stores, the stores that they go to buy lumber and stuff. So the problem is that all of these people work in many different systems. And the result is something like this. Um, so we are in this space uh, of an owner developer, a general contractor, and we also deal with our prime uh, subcontractor. So we're just focused on this space, but we haven't really solved for everybody else uh, that's ancillary to this uh, diagram. Any questions so far? Do you have in-house architects and like any engineers as well to, to do the building design? So typically, uh, general contractors are not arranged that way uh, for a good reason. If you have an architect, um, you may have one internally, but they cannot stamp the drawings. Um, the reason is because of liability. So for example, if I have an in-house architect, they stamp the drawing, we build it, something happens, it's a huge liability to uh, the contractor or wherever that person is. So companies that are in construction that have in-house architects typically don't have something called an architect of record or an engineer of record, AOR or EOR, for that particular reason. If they do have one, they usually belong to a different LLC that's held by that corporation as well. So uh, there's already a lot of digital disruption in construction, mostly in the US, and below are uh, the biggest players. Uh, just last year, there was well over $1.8 billion that was pumped into uh, these startups. And I came from Procore, and ever since, uh, these two have been acquired by a company called Autodesk, Procore acquired Roombix, um, and also acquired uh, Building Connected. All right, so now we're going to talk about product discovery. How many of you have heard about product discovery? All right, um, do you want to explain what it is? Um, it's like when you try to understand the problem space in your industry, to try to understand like what you should be doing and why, and what people care about. It's okay. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, <laughs> The ones that are product managers, uh, do you guys do product discovery yourself or you have user researchers? Okay, awesome. Um, the ones that are not uh, in product, um, do you guys talk to product managers that are trying to learn something within a tech company? Okay, what are they trying to learn usually? If you don't mind sharing. Oh, so you're asking me? Yeah. Right. Um, so we have a product owner who goes out and speaks with clients um, and then comes back to us with the result. And then we've got the business analyst who comes from the industry background and basically he translates users' wishes or their needs into the features and then my job is to implement those features. Makes sense. Um, so what I'm about to teach you is uh, more of the Procore and WeWork way which is uh, we believe in the core team. And the core team is essentially a product manager, a UX, usually the engineering manager on that team or a squad, as we call it. 
And the reason why we believe in the core team during product discovery is for something that we call shared understanding. The idea is so that we don't play broken telephone. So I may go to meet a customer, or I may hear something from a customer, but I may not be able to translate it into words that maybe the UX designer can understand uh, or the engineer can understand. The idea here is so that we learn together, we build the prototypes, we test them with the customers, and the whole team understands what needs to be built so that if something happens to me, the rest of the team can still carry on uh, with their product. And if something happens to me, means maybe I get moved to another team, so there's no more weak link. The whole team actually understands uh, what the problem space is and what the vision is and the strategy of how to deliver uh, those features. So vision is more like big picture, what do we want to do? And product strategy is mostly concerned with, well, how are we going to deliver uh, these features? The reason why product discovery is important with uh, UX and also engineering <coughs> is because you don't want to create a team of mercenaries, as I uh, call it. And mercenaries are just usually like engineers or UX that just get product requirements from a um, product manager or product owner, and they just go and execute. That's not really fun. And there is a stat that was actually done to show that when you have mercenaries on a team, they're more likely to leave after a year of working in the company, partly because you're not really connected to uh, that problem. Um, you also probably have never met those customers, so you don't have any empathy. Um, so those are just my observations. Uh, they may be right for some companies, they might be wrong for other companies, but generally speaking, I've seen this work across many companies. So here we go. As a product manager, we're always in the problem space. So always start with the problem. But how do you get there? Um, once upon a time, um, was uh, my first product job at uh, Procore, I got this email. Um, there is something called user voice. And what user voice does is people can go in and log uh, ideas or requests for features that they are looking for. So I was the lucky one that happened to work on contracts and people were asking for electronic signatures. Um, you might be able to tell on this screen that it was voted for about 113 times. That doesn't mean 113 people, it means 113 companies uh, wanted this uh, feature. So obviously it was like a very big uh, problem and these were some of the comments that we were receiving from users. Now, one of the obvious answers would be like, well, go and build an electronic signature solution. But remember, as a product manager, you always want to start off with data to support your assumptions. The big question I asked myself was, well, what is the annual percent of construction volume in the US, right? And I found out that it makes about 7% of the US GDP. And the reason why that mattered was because for every dollar that's counted in the GDP, it starts off as a contract, and that's what they want to sign. So that was mostly saying that like, hey, the total addressable market for this feature right now in our product market fit, meaning the customers that are able to use our product from end to end, is about 6.5% of uh, the US GDP. Great numbers. Uh, then the second question we wanted to know was, how much do construction companies spend on technology? So we did a survey with existing customers. We found out that they spend less than 1% of their annual sales uh, on technology. If you look at uh, consumer-based uh, companies, they're spending upwards of 10% uh, of their sales on technology, which is what makes them very efficient. So, this is why construction companies are using uh, a lot of paper because they are just not spending a lot on technology. With that said, um, didn't mean that it was time for me to actually go and talk to uh, customers quite yet. The idea was first to align with your internal stakeholders or your internal teams. There's nothing as worse as a product manager picking up a phone and calling a random customer without checking, for example, with 
the sales team if they are trying to renew with that customer or with customer success. So the idea here is to first align with the internal teams about what you're trying to do and try to get the perfect customers to talk to you. So I made a checklist that you may use if you want to. Uh, you can modify it whichever way that uh, fits. But the first question you ask yourself is, uh, does this align with the company's OKRs? Who doesn't know what an OKR is? All right. Um, does anybody know the term managing by objectives? Have you heard about it? All right. There was this little company called uh, HP. Uh, they started this whole thing uh, of OKRs, and I'm going to get to how. Um, so it started off in the 70s with the idea of coming up with objectives, right? So they would say, we, we want to gain more customers. And the key results would be maybe we want 500 new logos uh, for that. So people who left uh, HP went to work for Intel. They perfected that method. And then there's a guy, Jack Dorsey, who brought it to Google. And that's where the word objective and key results came from. So it's just a way for a company to steer itself towards a particular goal that it wants to accomplish. So in other words, if your company doesn't have uh, OKRs, you probably should ask, like, hey, what are our priorities for this year? And if the particular feature or idea that you have does not match those OKRs, probably safe to say don't pursue it quite yet. Find something else to work on because it may not drive the key performance indicators that you're looking for. Second thing um, that you may do is always talk to the sales teams. If your company is selling software, there is something really useful that they uh, store in Salesforce if they, if they do have one or any CRM. Ask them, hey, how many deals did we lose? It's usually called the closed lost pipeline. The idea behind that is those should be tagged with features or missing products that a customer wasn't able to uh, have at the day that the salesperson was trying to sell. And if those features were available, then um, the customer probably would have purchased. So this is probably your first great metric, which is how big is that pipeline that we can immediately uh, capture if we had that feature. This becomes your serviceable addressable market, meaning that you already have some kind of contact with them. You don't need to make large sales efforts to capture uh, those new customers. Um, but if you deliver a particular feature and convert those, it's already proving value that like, hey, uh, the product that you shipped has generated X amount of revenue from closed pipeline. Um, Another trick that you can do is talk to the sales team and ask them, hey, I want to speak to sales prospects. Um, a lot of product managers disagree, but I'll tell you why this is the best idea. Um, the reason is because a sales prospect will always be very blunt with you. They're not biased, uh, and you're able to actually develop them uh, from being not being a customer, understanding their problems, and also exciting them about your own product culture. Uh, in my experience at Procore and at WeWork, I've noticed that when you do speak to prospects <coughs> about what you're trying to build, giving them that vision, it allows them to um, work closer with sales um, and make them feel like, hey, like we're part of building the solution that we're looking for. So my trick with uh, sales prospects is you can take a prototype, if you have one, uh, go on a call, talk with them, uh, and gauge their interest. Usually their feedback is super important. And what you can do um, is right after you get that feedback, go to your customer support or your customer success department. The reason is you want to ask for any customer support tickets that are coming in uh, around that particular product feature that you're looking for. Depends what kind of system they're using. If they're using something like Zendesk, uh, it usually has tags where they can say, hey, this person called in, or they pinged us because they were having this problem, and these were some of the features that they mentioned. So you can query that and compare it with the information that you're receiving from sales. If you did your job right, this is a ridiculously hard process. Um, you will find matches to say, hey, like, 
sales is saying the same thing as customer support or customer success, but it will never be the same as what hippos say. Hippos are large, but in a company, it just means highest paid people in the organization, or hippo, um, as I like to call it. Um, hippos are always wrong. Um, that is because they're trying to uh, usually give you a, a, or ask you to build a feature that will close one or two customers for the business. Um, it may be good for the business, but it's generally bad because that product that you build uh, based on what a hippo says is typically what we call a special. So it's configured for one customer uh, or a few customers and it ends up having like a lot of technical debt, doesn't really work for everybody else. But if you're armed with all this data, you're able to uh, speak to an executive and defend your thesis to say, hey, I sincerely agree with where you want to go, but here's the data that I do have. I have X amount of customers in the pipeline. Uh, we also have support tickets that correlate to um, what is happening uh, in sales and also existing customers. Another thing that is very popular with the product managers is talking to existing customers. Um, this can be done via the phone or using things like Zoom, uh, Skype. Um, I personally like to visit customers uh, on site um, and hear what they're uh, actually talking about. So most of these pictures that you're seeing are actually pictures that uh, I've taken on site with uh, customers actually learning what their uh, product requirements are. Boom, so we decided that let's go talk to sales uh, prospects. Uh, the idea here was we were just trying to find out what their workflows are and to validate if there is actually a need for electronic signature. The first uh, tool that I use uh, basically to understand a problem is what we call an empathy uh, map. Uh, some people call it the empathy map canvas. It basically asks a few questions. Um, the first question is to ask, like, you know, who are they? Who are the key people that you're talking to? Um, so in this case, we were mostly talking to contract administrators, accountants, and anybody that's involved in the purchase of a good or service during the construction process. The second goal is you need to ask them, you know, what do they actually do? So this is getting deeper into defining who your persona is and also you know, what their actual job is. So they'll tell you like the whole step to step <coughs> process of like, hey, this is what I do in order for me to get a contract signed. Um, and I'll show you artifacts later of what we learned. Um, what do they see? Literally ask them, like, what's in front of your desk? Uh, in our case it was piles of papers. Um, and I see a lot of contractors that are coming in, they see a lot of boxes, so just write it on there. It's all good, useful information. And this is why you need your UX and also your engineers on those calls as well, so they can hear and understand who their persona is. The next thing is, what do they say? Um, contractors, at least in the US, um, say the F word a lot, so wrote it down, F. Uh, and also a lot of frustration. Uh, and then um, you, can, you can also talk about what they do and also what they hear from other people. And the central section is mostly, hey, what are the current pains that they are facing around this process? So for us with electronic signature, it was the fact that, hey, uh, a contractor across town might even be one block away, um, writes a contract, puts it in the mail, uh, usually uses FedEx, right, and that costs like $30. They, the envelope arrives the next day, somebody has to open it, route it to somebody, uh, they go through it, sign it, somebody uh, uh, scans it, somebody else also prints it and they put it in a filing cabinet, and they also put it in another FedEx envelope and ship it across town. So that was really good for us to understand, hey, this is the pain that they are facing, which is it's very expensive to sign contracts on paper, it's slow, uh, and it's not as efficient. So then you ask your user, like, hey, like, if there was a hypothetical solution, 
um, you know, what would be the gains if, let's say, there was an electronic signature. So they'll list, like, hey, like, maybe I'll save time, um, it's more efficient, I'm happier at my job, or some of the things that we heard. So then, the important part about this, as you will see later, is when you're delivering your product, um, understanding the user and also everything that they do will translate into uh, basically like what we call a user story map uh, that will show you like, you know, this is how we're going to release the product in different releases. And I'll show you an example of one. So why should you try this method? Um, the idea of talking to prospects is that you basically create this uh, understanding with the user um, and you're also able to have a direct impact on your key performance indicator. So remember that sales pipeline that I was talking about? If you are able to demonstrate that, hey, if we build this feature, it's going to drive uh, this sales pipeline, that's gold for a product manager. You need to be able to talk in terms of, if I build this, this is what it's going to drive for the company. Um, it's also important to understand who your audience is. So if you're talking to a person in customer support, you can't really talk in terms of like high level uh, KPIs that only like a, a CEO can understand. So you may have to dumb down like, you know, what you want to communicate to a person based on who they are within the company. So who should be on these calls? Um, salesperson, obviously. So if you really want them to you know, keep selling the product. Uh, they will introduce you as the product manager and your role. Uh, try to invite product marketing. If you have a uh, product marketer or a marketing department, and the reason is because you want them to be able to tell that story once the product is released. That you know the pain that the user was facing was X, and they were wasting X amount of hours. But because we deployed the solution, they now save X amount of hours and here's a customer testimonial from them. Sales will love you if you can deliver a customer testimonial. Your job as a product manager is actually doing exactly that with the MVP. Meaning when you build your first little product and you ship it to your customer, you're supposed to get feedback from that customer. If you did your job well, they're supposed to at least uh, give you a testimonial. You should ask for one. But the idea behind it is if you have a customer testimonial, sales can use it to sell more product. The reason why testimonials are important, and you need between, I would say, like six to ten of them, is because other companies that are looking to purchase your product want to see other companies like them that have used your product. If you've done your job really well as an extra bonus, that person should be a raging fan such that they're willing to pick up the phone and talk to another prospect about your product. So as you're doing this MVP, develop those uh, relationships with uh, users that are willing to at least like write something that you can put on your website that sales can use or they can be a reference to your sales team. If you can do that, you're literally a rock star in the organization because you're delivering a great product that also has demonstrable sales. Any questions on that? Um, who would actually be getting the feedback or testimonial? Who would be actually um, eliciting that information? Because as a UX designer, that, um, that's what I'm trying to get into at the moment. But if if you have a product marketing and a UX designer as well, wouldn't they be trying to get the same information as well? So not necessarily. Um, in enterprise companies, product marketing works with sales. They basically provide the environment for sales to succeed. Um, UX works with product and engineering, right, to convert the problem into like a design that users can basically consume. And UX is important in this scenario because you want them to listen to a customer that does not have your solution today. So it's, it's mostly like, hey, like what is actually happening? Um, instead of you as a product manager going and trying to draw out like what that solution is going to be. 
In fact, um, I believe that engineers are the ones that have the best ideas. Uh, none of these people, except for engineers, should come up with a solution. Make sense? Yeah, it's counterintuitive, but uh, engineers know what's possible. Customers don't know what's possible. Do you guys understand that? Or are... So, for example, we can talk about blockchain, right? Um, but you as a consumer probably don't know the full extent of like what you can do with uh, blockchain. Only an engineer can tell you, like, hey, like, we probably can solve for this using uh, this kind of technology. You want to stay in the problem space. Just say, like, hey, like, this is what, what they want. They want to sign stuff. Uh, don't suggest anything. Stay out of that solution space. Just guide your team. Do you mean the engineers are architects or engineers are the coders? So you said the engineer will take the decision. That's it. So I, I put the guy in the. Yeah, so in, in this context, when we say engineers, we mean software engineers. Not architects. Not architects. I think there were more questions. What's your best way to get those testimonials? Because mostly, if you're selling enterprise software, there's a huge process around legal, and their legal team has to approve, and it usually is not well. Yeah, good question. Um, my preferred method is during the beta. Um, target customers that you are friendly with, um, and during the beta, or just before the beta, tell them, hey, on condition of me putting you into this beta, if you have a good time um, during this beta, or we're able to actually provide you with the value that you're looking for, then will you provide us with a testimonial? And be upfront with them to say the testimonial may go on our website and also sales materials, um, and if they agree, when the time comes, you usually have somebody from marketing get a written request from them to agree uh, to it, and then you can post it on your website. Um, in my experience, if you've been like upfront with the customer and you told them many months or weeks before, they're usually willing uh, to work with you and put it on their website. But there may be companies where you talk to a user who's nice, but their legal team just doesn't want to, to do that. That's, that's fine. Um, there are ways around it, which is you can ask the person uh, to just say, hey, like, uh, I individually, not part of this company, uh, vouch for this product and here's my title. Um, those people, you can use them basically for the phone references. So the other customer, the prospect, may be able to call and say, hey, it's John, uh, I work for Barclays Bank. Um, and that's already enough for the other person to say like, wow, like Barclays is using this software, maybe we should too. All right, so um, the MVP is like the typically the first thing that you're going to release. So remember um, what I say the first, which is the MVP is your minimum viable experiments. The first thing that you're going to like release to learn. Um, I'm notorious for shipping software that doesn't work on purpose. Uh, so if let's say we're doing this, this is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. So we were asked to do electronic signatures and I shipped a login page to DocuSign from the app. And people looked at me like, why did you do that? But it was the best idea ever. Um, and the reason is because you want to learn first from customers, like, is this worth solving for? Uh, you may talk to people early on, they'll say, yeah, 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 we'll, we'll use the software. But when you actually create the software, things are a little bit different. So you want to be able to talk to them, and if you can, try to go and work on as little as possible and then deliver the solution to them. Um, one good way of doing it is uh, something that we call a concierge test or a Wizard of Oz. Uh, Zappos was very uh, famous for that, like where they only had uh, literally a page with nothing behind it, and it was just like pictures of shoes. And a person would come and say, I want to buy this shoe. But it was basically the founder who would then run to a store downstairs, buy the shoe, put it in a box, and ship it. 
But what's beautiful about that is you're able to demonstrate that, hey, with very little effort, we've proven that, like, hey, there, are, there is a need for such uh, a product. What I did with uh, DocuSign was prove that people want to sign stuff by just tracking how many people go from Procore to the DocuSign login page. That's, that's all it did at first. And it was pretty crazy to see how many people were actually clicking uh, on, on that button. Uh, it was just a button that we shipped. Um, and I'll, I'll show you how we did it as well. Just a detail, what did the button say, say on it? Sign with DocuSign. That's all it says, and that's all it says today. Just a quick, quick question. Um, do you not think that having a salesperson on the call influences how a customer answers questions? So remember, in this case, you're talking to a prospect first. Um, so in this case, you want the salesperson to still do their job. You're just helping them. Um, and in so doing, you're also understanding what the customer problem is. Um, and what's good about that is you also keeping the salesperson honest uh, on the call. So if you hear them say something that your product doesn't do, clarify it and say, you know, we're not quite there yet, but uh, here's where we're going. Don't promise anything to a prospect. Sales will also pay you for that. So it's a little bit of a slippery slope, but if you're experienced in basic customer discovery, this will be a breeze to go through. Now, in the early days of uh, Procore, the reason why I say this was important was because we actually didn't have a product called Construction Financials. I sold mocks, uh, went on many calls, closed millions of dollars worth of uh, deals, but there was no products, just prototypes that we were showing. So just selling the vision and then executing on it with our product strategy. So. The three key things that you really want to ask are validate if uh, there is actually a problem, ask them if there is a solution today, and would they pay for it? Questions? Did you say you shipped a product that doesn't exist? You sold a product that doesn't exist? Yeah. And they bought a product that doesn't exist. They bought the license, and uh, yeah, with, without the software actually existing. And Procore didn't have a, a legal team that freaked out or something about selling something that doesn't actually exist yet, isn't there? Aren't there laws and regulations against that? Like when you sell something, you actually have to deliver something as well. I forget what it's called, but you know what I mean, right? Yeah, so uh, some enterprise products are sold as bundles. So you can bundle in your product uh, as a mock-up, right? Um, just be like, hey, like we are going to be delivering this solution um, in X amount of days. But if you buy today, here's your price. The beauty about it for a software as a service company is you just want to show that like you're 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 selling the the product, right? Like people are buying it, and that's all that matters, right? For the first year, the second year is when you actually charge the customer full value of what that product is. But you are making a legally binding commitment to deliver that functionality, right? Yeah. So how many did you ask to and how many would be done? So it varies. I try to talk at least five uh, customers. Um, if you can, try to talk to like you know three prospects, five existing customers. Um, typically, on any given week, I'm testing between 15 to 20 times uh, <coughs> prototypes. And it sounds like a lot, but it's, it's not really. Uh, if you really think about it, it's just like four phone calls a day uh, for you know, five days. Uh, and you can make some of these tests digital. Uh, so you might have spoken to some of these customers. So you just send them an email with the link to the prototype, and they can click through, provide you with that feedback. You can also record yourself which is the easiest way, uh, demoing through, uh, click through, send out like a Google survey uh, with very specific uh, questions and see what the results are going to be. So you can scale yourself that way too. Um, how sophisticated would the mock-up have to be? Would it be like something in vision or using something like Envision where you can kind of scroll around and get the kind of cool functionality like the mock-up of there? Yeah, very good question. 
Um, it does not have to be an envision. Um, recently, on a project that I'm working on, uh, I did not have a UX designer uh, or engineers yet, so it was literally just one product manager is the whole team. Um, <laughs> so, but there is a way to, uh, to, to test those prototypes, which is literally take out a piece of paper, draw what you think the solution would look like. Yeah. Uh, there's an app on your phone called Scannable. Take a photo of it, put it in a deck, go on a call with the customer. Um, take those little pieces of paper, yeah. go to a customer and be like, what happens if you click here? Uh, they'll be like, yeah, I think that this should happen. Yeah. Pull out the next piece of paper and just test that yeah. way. Um, I've literally tested the idea of like, you know, swiping for invoices, um, using like a video of somebody demoing on uh, Tinder and a piece of paper just being like, imagine if you swipe, like what will happen? Um, so you have to get really creative. That's just your job yeah. to, to get there. So there shouldn't be an excuse to say, I don't have a UX uh, person or I don't have an engineer. Like, let's just get the job done. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't worry about that at all myself, but wouldn't there be people that are worried that that comes across like unprofessional, amateurish, like, you know, we've got this fancy brand thing with our lovely slide decks and everything, and here comes someone who's doing stuff on bits of paper. I mean, I really wouldn't care, but some people are very into, you know, fancy brand design stuff and everything. It's too yeah. tech for them. Again, I think it depends on your discretion, depends on your company, uh, but generally speaking, the brands that I've worked for love this idea. Um, it's, it's not resource intensive, and even the person who's a UX designer would probably appreciate that you're saving them cycles from building something in Envision. In fact, before Envision started, that was the way of testing uh, prototypes as well. It also comes across as really innovative, like you're really thinking about this stuff right now, aren't you? You know, so can have very, can come across as very innovative to the customer as well. And the more low tech and sketchy you do it, the more they get the feeling like, wow, I'm experiencing the very beginnings of this. Right. And also remember, then maybe your minimum viable test uh, or experiment would be the prototype, right? Like. Uh, your UX designer delivers it. Imagine what that user is going to feel from this janky piece of paper to something that looks like real software. Um, it makes them feel like they were part of making the product and that's what makes them hooked uh, to the sense that they become your raging fan. You can deliver them as a testimonial to sales. Because um, that's your job, right? Deliver the product and testimonials. That's all you have to do. Would you ever do it in reverse? So basically have the prototype ready and then show them the, uh, the mock-up one and then deliver the prototype to them within a week or something, just do it personally? Um, if you have the bandwidth, you can uh, do that. But usually um, what I've seen, like product managers that I've mentored who, who try to do that, is their teams usually don't like them because you either told your UX person to work really hard on, on something and you know the, the issues that like you're gonna make the UX person build something uh, that probably won't even be part of the MVP yeah. right so you might be showing the end state um, and and that's not a good use of their their time like you really want to keep testing and talking to customers frequently because it, it teaches you a lot about where your product is supposed to go um, and it also allows you to actually leap over like your competitors. The best software companies are just talking to customers. The worst software companies are trying to match what the competitor is trying to do. So grow with the customer. They're not going to leave you if you're doing what I'm telling you. Yeah. Um, before I go on to the next one, the question, would you pay for it? there is a very creative way of um, asking that question. You could ask them like, would you pay for it? But they'll say yes, right? But they'll never really tell you the correct price or um, you know, if they're really, really, really willing to pay for it. So here's what you do. If you documented the problem in sequential steps and maybe broke it down into like, hey, like here are the four categories or processes within your business in order to like, get a document signed, which is like you, you receive it, 
um, you send it to somebody for signature, somebody signs it, and then you store it. So there are four things. You ask them, like, if you had $100, um, where would you put your money? Um, give them a little greed off paper, um, and they'll, they'll put values in each one of them. What's interesting about it is where they put the highest amount of money is what you should be focusing on. That's where the value uh, is. But there's also a caveat to that, which is you might also not be able to build that particular feature right away. Uh, you might need some other features before that to, to get to solve the core problem that they're willing to pay for. So for, for example, let's talk about a travel uh, website, right? So here is a live test. We want to make an app that allows people to uh, collaborate and search for travel, pay for it, and go somewhere. If I told you that I'm just going to build you a website where you can search and returns results, out of a show of hands in this room, how many would use it? <coughs> Zero, right? Okay. <coughs> what if I added scheduling to it? How many would use it? So now you can schedule and you can also, um, yeah. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm only going to focus on her. I don't care about anybody else because that is my minimum viable product. I'm just going to make her happy. I've already proven that there is value in just the search engine and a uh, um, account uh, to it. Now, what if I say we're going to add payments? How many people would uh, use this? More people, right? So I'm um, adding more and more users, but in my first version, I only had to focus on her. And I probably don't need to move to version two until she's like, you know, I, I want payments. Uh, or I go to my sales team and I say, you know, how many deals are we losing? They'll probably say, we're losing a lot because we don't have payments and it's X dollars. So prioritize that and I got uh, people uh, coming. Um, what else would the rest of the group need to use this travel engine that we're talking about? What are the features that are missing? Ratings. What is it? Uh, ratings in places. Ratings. Okay. So boom. What if we added ratings? Uh, how many would use it? Including the existing ones. <laughs> Alright, what else is uh, lacking in this idea? Price optimization. Price optimization. What does that mean? So if I want to go somewhere, what, when's the cheapest time I can go out my range of the of what? All right, so what happens if we add that? Uh, are there any people that would uh, use it? Any additional ones? Yeah, so it's that kind of thinking, like where find out what is the minimum uh, amount of work that you need to do to just get one person to use the product and start getting feedback. It's easy to dream when you have zero, uh, but once you ship the product and you have these little numbers coming, sometimes things just don't seem possible and it can be discouraging, but that's actually good feedback that you're getting from users that, hey, like maybe this little other feature that you were hoping would work is, is a wrong assumption. Like I've shipped a product where uh, somebody was like, the button's uh, not colored right. And it was like, that's it? Like if we color the button right, like you would actually use the product. And we didn't have to build all these other features like, you know, uh, PDFs or how to extract the data from the app using like um, CSV files. So um, always think really small first. So I think we spoke about why it's important to take your team on these calls, which is it creates uh, user empathy. So imagine now your UX designer is hearing that, hey, like electronic signatures really suck. Uh, <laughs> Like, we need to make them better. Um, your engineers also get a shared understanding. Uh, on these calls, um, even the ones with actual customers, encourage them to ask questions. And the way to do that is prep them before uh, the call, because for every success you're gonna have, it's all about what you did the day before. Not the hour before the actual call. Try to do it a day before, so you give them time to think about, hey, like, this is the objective, um, we're trying to build this um, in the future. Um, I want you to think of you know, engineering questions that you need to answer in order for you to be able to know what that solution is going to be. So with the engineers that I work with, um, 
the way that I train them is we, we go on a few calls together, so it might be three, uh, and then I step back and I let them start asking questions. We may prepare a little script, but they get comfortable um, talking to <coughs> the customer, um, hearing them out, and they can also insert their own technical questions, UX questions. If you have marketing, they may also ask marketing type questions as well. Um, the data that you collect um, is usually a baseline metric because when you ship that little experiment, um, any metric that you try to come up with is a vanity metric, uh, meaning that the product isn't technically working yet for her, maybe end to end, um, and whatever data you're going to generate isn't as useful against existing customers. But maybe you can collect data such as, it takes me five hours to sign a single document. That's really useful. Um, because once you ship the, the litter experiment or the MVP that you have, you can measure to say, well, how long does it take to uh, sign this document? And it better be uh, equal to or below uh, what that uh, customer is currently experiencing. If it exceeds that, then it's already a pain for that person to, to use. Questions? Before I go to the next slide. I went through this and it was a mess just having Excel and other documents and the transcripts of the call. But sharing that data then with, say, other teams' um, full data, what do you use to consolidate that and share it? Yeah, you'd be really surprised. Um, so here's the trick. Take your team into a, a room, get a, get a user on a Zoom call or whatever, have them do the task and time it. That's all, it, that's all you need to do. No, I mean yeah. all the questions of all of the customers. Gotcha. Um, I use uh, a few tools. Um, my favorite one, honestly, is uh, Google Sheets. So you write a grid of questions that you ask everybody, and on top it's just like the customers that you spoke with, um, and you can actually see what each customer say based on that question. Another way is uh, Google Forms. Uh, what's cool about Google Forms is on these calls, ideally as the product manager, you don't want to be the one who's taking notes. Um, you want UX or engineering to take notes. If you're not the one who's speaking, then you're the one who's taking notes. But the interesting part about it is everybody's learning uh, somehow by listening, some are writing, um, based on their understanding. And when you do the debrief after, um, you then create what we call the shared understanding of like, this is what we understand the problem to be. And what's cool about it is they will keep you honest. Uh, when you do try to slip in features that are not part of the MVP, uh, I've been told by engineers that, hey, like, that is not what we agreed on. And it's really important because um, it keeps you very honest. And it also means that in the event that the product doesn't uh, succeed, it's not on you, it's with the whole team as well. Um, but if you do have that buy-in from your team, like odds are they're willing to do whatever it takes uh, in order for the product to actually succeed. Uh, unless you're solving the wrong problem completely. How, how long did your feature take to roll out the signature? Yeah, we're getting there. Okay, so. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yeah, don't promise anything to uh, customers uh, or prospects. Uh, and uh, my favorite is actually visiting uh, existing users. Uh, I took this picture um, in uh, San Luis Obispo, and this guy, his name is uh, Grant Robbins. He's actually now one of my very good uh, friends and mentors. Um, so he actually took us on, on a construction site. It was like, you know, it would be great if I could sign for something on, on the field, because if you're on a construction site, there's no internet there, right? But contracts are coming straight into his office, and after the end of the day, he's really tired. He's standing in the sun, um, he's doing really hard work, um, and then he's got to go home and sign all these uh, contracts. So um, we noticed that like they were carrying a lot of tablets uh, on site. Um, they obviously are not connected to internet, but they do buy data plans uh, for them so that they can send information back and forth. So that was a key learning for us that, well, even though there isn't hardwired internet on a construction site, 
odds are most of these construction uh, people have tablets. And we researched that to find out like who buys the most tablets, like what type of companies. And you guessed it, construction companies buy a lot more tablets than uh, most industries. And most of it is just so that they can do work on a construction site. Um, and the reasons why are, you know, sometimes you may look like that uh, as a team. So that was one of the trips that we took uh, to the left. It was all for the same problem that we were really trying to solve for. Uh, so we bonded really well. And the picture to the left was actually, is still being used for recruiting uh, at Procore. <laughs> uh, we went to the top of the Empire State Building and Evan forgot to unbutton his uh, suit. <laughs> he, so uh, this is Connor. Uh, Connor was my uh, UX designer. And uh, this is Brian. Uh, Brian was the engineering manager. And um, Evan came on the first half of the trip as um, a uh, user researcher. Anybody know who this is? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't ask how uh, that, that happened. Uh, we were randomly just like walking, asking people questions. It's like, hey, I know construction. <laughs> but I figured I'd just put it there because it, it was like so random that we bumped into him and asked us what we were doing. <laughs> All right. Um, in talking to customers, these are some of the things that we heard. Um, so direct quote. We're literally running out of uh, storage space for documents that have been executed from uh, hundreds of projects. So they literally had a room full of boxes because you're required by law to keep that documentation in the US for seven years. So you can either go rent a storage um, unit, which will cost more money, but the problem with that is Construction is also one of the most litigious industries, so if you do need to reference that, uh, you gotta go all the way to the storage place, um, pull out the document, bring it back, then go store it again. I took this picture uh, in front of a lady, her name is Mary. Uh, I can tell by the corner of her eye, she's just like, I don't know what I'm gonna do with uh, all this paperwork. So you remember from the empathy map, it was like, now, what do you see? It's like miles of paper. Um, you wouldn't understand it until you actually go to the customer's uh, office, try to do the job, if, if you're allowed to, ask them like, hey, can I just be like your intern? Or like, try to do some of the work that you're doing, just talk me through it. Um, the cool thing about it is you understand all the processes that they're trying to do, even better if you have your team there Right? So then an engineer is already starting to think like, this is how I'm going to architect uh, this, this system. They start to ask the really hard and important questions that maybe a product manager is not technical, um, is unable to answer. So if you're curious what these documents were, <laughs> um, these, these were the stacks of documents and what they exactly were. Uh, so many kinds of uh, documents that they, they were storing and this still happens in many construction companies uh, around the world which is why if, if you want uh, join tech companies that are in this space very good problems to solve here um, we found out what the manual workflows were so we literally went and drew this diagram uh, which was good for the rest of the company and the team to understand like hey like this is the problem that we're solving for so it always starts off in a some kind of like word document, right? Um, somebody prints it, they sign it, uh, they may scan it, right, and say like we're a digital company. Um, but what it really means is like they have some paper processes, so they scan it, email it, somebody else prints it, signs it. Uh, they might do the same thing, um, send it to somebody via email, and then. Uh, in every construction company that we went to, we saw a filing cabinet. So to us, we asked them the question, what, what's in those filing cabinets? And in some cases, those filing cabinets, no joke, are literally against all these walls and they're filled with contracts or some kind of like paper 
uh, based document that needs to be acted upon. So then we set about to say, hey, we've actually learned what the real problem is, so let's now define what the minimum viable product is. Um, so again, there's another checklist uh, for that. <coughs> so the first thing we needed to do was make sure we we're aligned with the stakeholders or the highest paid people in the organization, the hippos. The reason is um, you may have the best idea, but if you don't have their blessing, um, it's not going to succeed. Um, the resources may be shifted to build something that they feel is a priority. Plus, it's just also a good practice for you to align with uh, the executives first to get their buy-in before you build uh, anything. Uh, B, we also wanted to align with the sales and marketing team before we build the product so that we can uh, create what we call the right conditions for release. Um, what this means is you literally go and talk to sales and say, we're about to build this feature. You can't talk about it though uh, on uh, sales calls because it doesn't exist quite yet. Uh, will it have an impact on, uh, on what you're doing? And when can we release this uh, product? So it's not disruptive to the core of the business. Um, if you are in one of those companies that also requires you to document the business case, um, I did this one in uh, uh, PowerPoint. Uh, at WeWork, we are famous for what we call the PRFAQ. Uh, it stands for Press Release Frequently Asked Questions. Um, it's the working backwards theory uh, from Amazon. So you start off with a one-pager that imagines like a future date when you release the product. And that date has to be realistic. And you write it literally like <coughs> you saw it in the New York Times or the uh, Wall Street Journal. And it has eight key questions that you're really asking. Um, the most important ones are, what exactly is the problem? Um, and it sounds very simple, but that question number one is the hardest of them all. Um, you might understand what the problem is. And most product managers understand the solution but they haven't spent enough time to actually understand the problem. You gotta back up that uh, problem with supporting data or uh, metrics. The <laughs> other question that you have to ask yourself is, you know, why should we build this product? Um, why are we uniquely in a position to, to build this product? Um, and why can't we use another you know, existing solution? Um, your recommendation to the executives and also how you're going to get there, including like, you know, here are the resources that I have, here is the current roadmap, and if we want to build this, we have to either deprioritize something or, um, you know, add this in, but like what is the impact of like deprioritizing something and putting a feature on top. Um, you also got to do your product discovery debrief. Um, I usually do them in PowerPoint. Um, and I can show you examples later. Um, and then also go into grooming and uh, estimating. Now, if you didn't go with engineers, um, this is where product managers get caught, which is um, because an engineer doesn't know the product uh, or the solution that you're trying to build, they'll go into the old t-shirt size. Uh, they'll say, is this a small, a medium, or a large? If you ever get into that um, position, something's wrong. Uh, it means that the engineer is just telling you like, dude, I don't know um, this solution, so I'm just gonna tell you like, you know, whatever I think. And a small may end up turning out to be like an extra small, or something that they thought is small is like super large. Um, and if they give you a large, it just means like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's, that's what it really means. Uh, question. So how, how, how would you expect them to estimate it, given they're not using the t-shirt sizing? What approach would they use? That's why you should bring them on the calls. Okay. Um, learn with them. Yeah. Um, if, if you did your job right by bringing them on these calls, mm -hmm. you're probably already building that backlog of the core features, right? Like when you're doing those calls, you debrief with them, and then you decide like, this is the MVP that we're going to build. and in your engineering um, manager or whoever was on uh, those calls, they should be able to actually start uh, providing you with reasonable estimates. 
So what I typically do is we're, we're talking to customers, uh, we're already building tickets, uh, we have RFCs or request for comments, they're already playing around with technology like spiking to see how hard it's going to be to actually get that product into market and also how to build it. It's not part of the sprint. Um, if you want to, you can negotiate with them and just say like, hey, like we can budget X amount of points for the sprint. But basically an RFC is just a document to say, you know, this is what we intend to use. This is the data structure, this is the architecture. Can you please comment on this? And it's for other engineers to say, yeah, I think this is a great solution and we're going to implement it using this type of technology. So when you come to uh, grooming, uh, for you, it's just really hard. It's really easy for you to just say, I want to deliver this. Can you estimate it? Because they already understand the context of this is what the product is supposed to do. In fact, you're at this point, you should be able to remove yourself and the team should be able to function. You understand? All right. Um, so we really only had two options, which was uh, build our e own e-signature solution or uh, integrate with an uh, existing solution. Obviously, going with <coughs> option one is suicide, um, given that you know electronic signature is used around the world. It's regulated by, uh, in some cases, towns. Um, and in, in some cases in the states, it's like every state has different laws. So that was not going to be a, a start for us, and we decided to integrate with an existing solution. One of the things we did was we sent out surveys to uh, customers in that user voice to ask them, what is the electronic signature solution that you use? And coincidentally, we found out most of them use DocuSign, but not for what we thought they used it for. They were using it for hiring, so you hire somebody and they uh, sign, but they weren't using it on a construction uh, project or for construction related uh, things. But as a product manager, that was encouraging for me because it was just like, well, maybe then we can go to DocuSign and ask them um, you know, if, if we can integrate with them. Um, the first interactions we had with that DocuSign, uh, they basically told us to go pound sand. Uh, <laughs> uh, so what, what, what it, that means is they were just like, go away. Uh, this is not really like a use case we're uh, interested in solving for. So we flipped the tables uh, on them. Uh, the engineer that I was working with um, found a piece of code in their uh, API. We, we, we now call it BYOD, which is bring your own DocuSign. So that's how we came up with that solution of delivering just the login page. So all it did was we asked him, like, hey, can you build this uh, experiment or MVP? And he did it in eight hours, and we shipped it to a closed beta, just one user. Um, the success criteria, they authenticate with DocuSign. That's, that's all we needed to see, that they click the button that says sign with DocuSign, and they went to DocuSign, they put in their username and password. If they go in, then bingo. Like, we know that they're willing to put in the work to then download the PDF from our solution, um, manually port it into uh, DocuSign, sign it, and that was just enough for us to say, like, we've got a winner here. So the goal of the MVP is really to learn. Oh, go for it. Um, so you said that you've got, like, you do a closed beta with one user. Yeah. Um, if that one user fails, how, how, like, what's the limit? Do you just stop that one user? And you're like, oh, this is fail. It's not working. So it's the same as what we did with the travel thing. Um, so you keep iterating. Okay. The goal is to learn, uh, right? It's, it's, the MVP is never really about like shipping the product. It's always about learning. So that is one of the reasons why you need to align with your stakeholders. because They might hear the word MVP, and what they're really thinking about is like an actual fully blown uh, product. And well, let's pin these questions until the, the end, just so we can finish these. Um, so this is actually the, the actual whiteboard that we, uh, we defined the MVP uh, and like what we wanted to do. Um, and these were the initial mocks. So I think somebody was saying that like, hey, like, uh, they, they might not look really pretty, but literally I took a computer 
and Zoom and just focused on these. And customers were like, no, remove this and, and do that. And we d just delivered this part. That's all, that's all we delivered. But check out what happened. Um, so it was enough for us to just learn that a person going here, putting their password, uh, logging in, meant that they want to execute uh, something. Today, uh, the product does a lot more than that. So we can automatically transfer a document using what we call webhooks into DocuSign and a person can actually sign uh, a document without like the first first version that we uh, built and they're able to actually be automatically uh, transported back to Procore. So it's now like a seamless end-to-end -end, uh, solution. And what you saw just before was just like the you know, sign with DocuSign button. That was the first thing that we, we shipped. None of this actually existed. So we shipped the button, then we learned from users that, oh, I need the PDF to already exist in DocuSign, so I don't need to drag and drop it. So we, we built that. Then the next thing was, I want to be brought back to uh, ProCore. We, we built that. Um, and we kept asking for feedback, like, you know, what should we do next? Uh, I need sync banners. Uh, <coughs> if the uh, uh, document has been signed, show me that it's been signed. Then it's like, okay, the document's been signed, change the status to say, you know, it's been signed, meaning it's approved. Now you can send it to an accounting integration. But I didn't need to build that all at first in order to prove that the product is actually really successful. So, uh, obviously, now people can sign for uh, documents uh, electronically on their iPads. We were the first ones in the world to do that for the construction industry um, using what we call construction management uh, platform. Um, we developed uh, raging fans, testimonials, uh, so this is now Chris Lingiza, who is the uh, director of uh, VDC. Uh, VDC is a type of technology that's used in construction, but they have many apps that they were using, and uh, they say DocuSign produced the highest ROI uh, so far. So it means that for a salesperson, they literally can say, like, look, there is this guy uh, from Styles Construction. This is what he said. You can call him if you want as well. Um, another uh, raging fan was like, hey, like, you know, we actually switched from Adobe uh, to go to DocuSign because of the integration with uh, Procore. So we use this testimonial for people that are like, hey, I use Adobe, and it's just like, no, like, just call Matt. Um, he's going to uh, tell you that, like, Adobe, like, may not work for what you're trying to do. Um, then uh, the product was, like, really successful. Uh, in our like first uh, 120 days or so, we were signing about 6,000 documents a day. It's a lot, from zero to 6,000. Just think of like what 6,000 documents looks like. Um, so it was pretty wild to DocuSign that told us to go pound sand, such that uh, I'm on stage uh, with their chief product officer, uh, scooping up innovation of the year. We beat Salesforce and Microsoft. That's how significant this was, because it was just like, we didn't take that much time to, to build this. Uh, and we worked with them uh, as well. So, guy from Salesforce, girl from Microsoft. <laughs> and we did it again the following year. <laughs> uh, 22,000 documents uh, a day, 800 companies. Um, so we wanted back to back. Uh, this time, uh, Ron Hirsch, their CEO, um, and a bunch of other people. Of course, like I wore the construction outfit to illustrate the, uh, the problem <laughs> that we're trying to, to solve for. All right, so remember, MVP, minimum viable product, is really an experiment. You want to do the least amount of work just to test if the idea uh, works as well.